Hey, welcome back to Good Life Tampa Bay. Now in this segment, we take a look at a local singing sensation, the talented and beautiful Lisa Casolino, who's launching her second album. Check out my interview. Lisa Casolino is now one of the most sought after jazz singers in the Tampa Bay area. You'll find her singing in local restaurants, at events, and she tours all over Florida. You'll also see her performing the national anthem at many top sporting events. Lisa is originally from Long Island, New York, and has lived in the Tampa Bay area for the last 13 years. Combined with her incredible music talents, unique voice, her beauty, along with her amazing persona, unstoppable determination, and nonstop work ethic, Lisa is passionate to share her music with the world. I had a chance to sit down with her at the Marriott Courtyard in downtown St. Pete for a one-on-one -on -one spotlight interview as we talked about her new album called I'm Old Fashioned. Yeah, this is my second record, and um, there's six original songs on it, four standards. And uh, the whole theme of the record is just, um, well, I'm old fashioned, you know, I sing the jazz standards. Yeah. And my look is sort of retro, yeah. you know, most of the time. And so, um, and there's a song, the title song is, is a standard, it's not something I wrote, I'm old fashioned. And uh, just the, the lyrics of it really resonate with me. So that's what we decided to call the record, and the artwork's done, and it's a very vintage-looking photo, and then the whole record just kind of revolves around that and my lifestyle and, and things happening in my life, and the sound of the record is, even though the songs are new, I just wrote them, they're written in the style of like a Gershwin, and the lyrics are, yeah. you know, like a Cole Porter yeah. type thing. So. And where do you get your, when you're doing your writing, where do you get your inspiration from, and where do you draw <laughs> from to be able to, and how hard is writing? You know what, it comes for me, it's, um, when I, would, when I thought I wanted to do a second record, it seemed like inspiration was everywhere, whether it be good or bad, because yeah. there's some happy songs or some sad songs yeah. or some fun tongue-in-cheek songs. And so when I decided to write a record and do the songs that I wrote, um, inspiration, they're, they're, all, they're all actually about a situation that happened or inspired by a situation that happened. Okay. So I don't want to give too much away yeah, because people be like, hmm, I wonder who she wrote this song about or I know why this happened. So yeah. people who know me, like really, really know me, will know where the songs kind of right. came from, but um, they're, they're all the styles are different too, meaning some are, um, so I have one song that I'm actually going to make a music video to, it's called Is That on the Menu, and it's, I wrote it with three voices, like Andrew Sister's style, mm -hmm. and it's a really fun, fun song, and then another one has a Latin feel to it, another one has a, a French feel to it, I actually hired an accordion player to play on it, another one's more Gershwin, and so, you know, it's, uh, it's an eclectic mix. Compare this process to your first, your first CD, your first album. Talk about the differences, your first one, and then now you're following up. What's okay. the process? Uh, the, well, I'm co-writing with Nate Najar, who's also producing the record. We're a great team together. Um, we're good friends, and he always does the best for me. I know that, so I trust him. And this time around, we decided to record it locally and use local musicians, whereas last record we did in New York City. Oh. Um, but they were all musicians that Nate has known before, and so um, it's... It's nice when you're working with people that you care about and that know you and know your career and, and gig with you on a regular yeah. basis, and then you're like, hey, let's make a you're record. Right step together. You can just exactly. go together. Yeah. Just pick up where you left it, off. Exactly. Right? It's yeah. not, you'd, be, you'd be surprised how easy this process is for me and how quickly I can get a, a real record done, you know, because it's jazz. And so I, le I leave a lot to the musicians who are phenomenal to do yeah. their own interpretations and improvisations on the song. So we go in there with a very basic chart that Nate writes up and we have a few ideas that we want to you know implement but other than that we're like all right let's let's record see you at the end we're all looking forward to it you have a launch party I do on I'm, May 20 May 22nd I'm having a concert at the Palladium in St. Pete and people can get oh, tickets great now venue. I know I can't wait um, I'm so excited to be there it is a great venue and it's gonna be more of my first CD release was more of a party even though I, I performed, people were kind of treating it like a gig, you know, talking and having drinks and eating and everything. This is going to be more of a listening concert. Wow. Is that kind of like your first, this kind of venue format? Like, a, like I know This you. is the first time I'm at the Palladium, yeah. you know, and I've done, I've done a couple of concerts before, um, but mostly what I do are, you know, outside venues yeah. and, um, you charity know, like events, charity uh, events, parties, restaurants, restaurants things yeah, like that, yeah. where people, it's, you know, it's more of a social thing. It's not really yeah. a concert or listening room. Yeah. I did the Clearwater Jazz Holiday. Mm -hmm. I did the Ibor City uh, Festa Italiana, yeah. the Ibor City Jazz. So, I mean, this is going to be um, 
for me, a, a you know concert release where it's a CD release concert. Awesome. I want it to be themed. I'm actually going to talk to them about having it an old fashioned theme, yeah. so people can kind of dress up, you know, vintage if they like. Oh. And it's encouraged, it's not required. Be a great it's going to be so much fun. Plenty of tickets to Oh yeah. Still. I don't know how we are in ticket sales because okay. it's all going through the Palladium. But if they go to mypalladium.org and search Lisa Casalino, they can find you know the link to buy my oh. my tickets. So Exciting. there's pre-sale now. Yeah. Well, you know, I always, I've interviewed you before. You've been on Good Life Tampa Bay numerous yes. times before. Yes, I love I've your always show. See, I've always seen you around town, events, charity events. Lisa, you're always there singing. But what really got me or inspired me to sit down and want to talk to you is that I was looking at something on your website, and you said you're from Queens, New York. Yeah. And if you remember when I reached out to you, I said, I said, hey, girl, are you from Queens, New York? And I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, and that's when I, I had this idea of doing some interviews when I was interviewing R. Anthony earlier today. So t t tell us a little bit about your background, and then I also want to know about your music background and getting inspired, and, okay. and let's talk a little bit about that yeah. process. Yeah, well, I was born in Jackson Heights, Queens, yeah. but we, we moved to Long Island, way yeah. out in Long Island. Yeah. Everyone's like, what exit, right? So yeah, Hopes, what exit off the LA? Yeah, it's right. like, exit 62, exit it's Hopesville. Okay. And I always say I was raised out on the island by wolves, you know? And my mother's <laughs> Italian, my father's right. Jewish, and I'm in therapy like that musical. <laughs> And people joke about it, but it's true. My mom's Italian. My father's Jewish. Um, we grew up in Long Island, and uh, I moved to upstate New York when I was in high school. Okay. So I didn't graduate in Long Island, but I moved to upstate New York, and um, from there I went to school for music yeah. at uh, SUNY State University of New uh, York yeah, in Potsdam. Soon, yeah. So they have the Crane School of Music there. Yeah, sure. And it kind of got a little bit of a spotlight because... So you, at what point did you know so you wanted to go into... And you, oh, it was a passion? At what, I always... At, at what age did you kind of sense... You know, growing up, my parents always had music playing in the house. My mom played guitar, and she would sing to us as little kids. My uh -huh. dad had all, like, thousands of 45 records and jukebox. 45s? I don't remember. Yeah. I'm, too, I'm too young for that. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, you know, somewhere before the 8-track, you know, cassettes, you know. Um, but, no, my father just had a great music collection and was always playing music in the house and so I always would sing as a little girl yeah. and then I was in the chorus and the orchestra and then the band when we moved to upstate they didn't have an orchestra so I took a saxophone in the band I played violin oh did you yeah violin, violin was my first instrument oh my goodness and then I always did you sang. have a passion was it more than the other the instrument or the singing or uh, violin I loved and I, I was actually not in the chorus when I got to middle school because you had to choose and so I forgot I could just sing anywhere I'll just be in the orchestra with the violin, but when we moved to upstate New York, the school was smaller, we could be in both band and chorus. <laughs> and so I was in both, and I took the saxophone, and I had the best music teachers, and I'm friends with them wow. still today. Wow. Um, yeah, I had the best music, Jackie Morrow was my music teacher in ninth grade, and then Mr. Yeah. and Mrs. Connie, married couple, right. they like ran the whole music program at the school, and they're just phenomenal inspirations, and my parents have really encouraged me, you know, to keep following awesome. my passion, and so I knew I wanted to be a music teacher. Yeah. And so that's what I did. I went to school to be a music teacher at the Crane School of Music, which I was going to say, um, just had like, a, Renee Fleming just sang the the uh, national anthem for the Super Bowl. Yeah. Renee Fleming is, um, you know, a, a Grammy Award winning opera singer. She sings at the Met all over the world. She's world famous and she's a, an alumni of the Crane School of Music. Oh, wow. You know, so that was kind of cool to see our little, you know, school, music school on the map for that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I went to school for, for music education and taught for a year in New York while I got my master's. Did you? W upstate New York? Mm -hmm. uh, there okay. was a school. I wasn't going to teach right away, but there was an opening right there so I can get my master's and teach. Awesome. Perfect. So I know. So I just, yeah. I did that. And then uh, my friend and what was... So in teaching, having that first teaching experience and interacting with <laughs> students, what was that like for you? It was fun. I mean, I was young. Obviously, I was 21 yeah. years yeah. old teaching, you know, 7th through 12th grade. So I had 18-year-olds yeah. for students. But I was a young teacher, just out the gate. I mean, I was enthusiastic. I, I knew what I wanted, how I wanted my program to be. And I had a great first year. It was a lot of yeah. fun. And then an opportunity opened up down here in Florida. A friend of mine from college was teaching down here. Yeah. And they were opening a brand new high school. And in New York, as you know, there's no brand new schools. Yeah, schools no. are, you know, hundreds yeah. of years old. Yeah. So I'm like, wow, a new school. I can start my own program. I can, you know, from scratch. I wrote had, down. Had you been to Tampa, to, to St. Pete area? Had you been you know, down I've before? You know, I've been to Orlando, you know, Disney <laughs> yeah, World. <right. laughs> but that's it. But I had a couple of friends that were living down here. And I was in upstate New York, mind you. Yes. Cold. Okay. I was kind of over. Yeah, I know. I know. The cold. You know, where the and door even doesn't in Long warm. Island, it's cold, too, in it's Long cold. Island, too. It doesn't warm up that Everything much. Everything freezes. You have to drive holding the door shut because it's frozen the locks <laughs> with the ice. I'm just peeking out of a little hole because I'm too lazy to, you know, bite yeah, the snow off. Yeah. Forget it. So, um, you know, to 
to open a new program was just too, too good to pass up, and the principal was amazing. And, and that was your gateway to Florida? That was it. And I was at it's Durant High School. I okay. wrote the alma mater, and uh, I taught there for eight years. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. I, and I'm still good friends with a lot of the teachers that were there and the administration and the students now that are in their you know, mid-30s, parents yeah. themselves. And, and how did you embrace the Tampa Bay area with you you're loving what you're doing, you're teaching in yeah. Tampa Bay area? What did you how did you embrace the area of living here? Oh I loved it. I mean it's you know, it's just uh, I did some community theater and I you know, started meeting people and going out and it was just, you know, a good opportunity for a young new teacher to be yeah. able to experience all of that and yeah. so So at what point do you make a decision <laughs> to leave the security of a job and a paycheck, right? Yeah. And then you take tell me about your passion, your vision, and you stepping out and you know going to the next level with with music and singing. Talk, talk a little bit about that. You know, that. people. I look back and I and now being you know when you get older you get a little less you know you're a little more timid on making yeah. such big changes. I was um, younger then. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to say how old I am, but everyone knows anyway. Yeah. But I was you know I was teaching about nine years at this time. I was eight years at this school. I was thirty one. And I just was kind of like, I felt like I was missing on something. Okay. You know, all my other friends that were, were you not. Were doing any gig? Were you singing at all? You know, at I, was, all? I, was, you? I was singing on the weekends. You were? You know, okay. every other weekend I was singing. What kind singing of venues back then? Stumps. I was at Stumps Supper Club from like 2001 to 2003. Okay. That was like my first regular. I mean, before that I was here and there with little bands. I was singing with the trio at that, the, um, the pier, Chacha Coconuts yeah. and the Thunderbird and St. Yeah. Pete, yeah. little things. And then I started to sing more regularly at Stump Supper Club and, and Channel Side. And, um, and then I was offered an opportunity to sing. At that point, I kind of knew I, was, I just wanted to take a leave of absence for teaching. I'm like, let me just take a break. Let me just see what's, what's going on, okay. you know? And, um, because the fire, thinking that that's what you want to be, you want to be singing. Well, I've always no. It wasn't even that. It was. It was just the point that I, I was, I loved teaching. I loved teaching so much that I wasn't loving it as much. Huh. And I was like, okay, the kids deserve better. I deserve better. Like, I don't want to do anything if it's not a hundred percent. Wow. That's just how okay. I am. Yeah. And that's just how I've always been. So when I feel like mm, I'm, I'm not as jazzed up about doing. Yeah. this right now I don't want to talk to these kids right now <laughs> like you know and so I thought let me just take a leave you know because you have that I was tenured and yeah. I have that you know I can you know but in that year that I decided to take the leave I was offered a full-time singing position um, out of the beach at a resort and uh, I was bartending I was just I was kind of just seeing what's what's happening yeah, I wasn't really that right. afraid I wasn't really that scared and to be truthful and honest yeah. people give me too much credit first of all I'm single and I didn't have a family to consider. It was just right. me. And I was a teacher, which you're not making a lot of big bucks yeah. there. You yeah. know, there's job security, but it's not like you're yeah. leaving a six-figure job. Yeah. So it's still scary, you know. Sure. But, um, you know, in New York, I'm always I'm permanently certified. I, certifi you know, I was certified at the time in Florida to teach. So it, for me, it didn't seem like such a risk. I, but I'll tell you, the day, the first day of school, that next year when I wasn't there, I cried my eyeballs out. You were feeling I did. it. If you felt was, it, didn't you? Yeah, right? I was like, oh my God, I'm not at the school. Like, it's no longer my baby. Someone else is like babysitting my baby. Yeah. And I thought maybe I'd go back. But the way that life turned, I, you know, I got into real estate. I was singing. And then I did go back to teaching part time. And I was okay. doing all three. Uh -huh. And then I, um, I eventually my voice started to, it started to wear at my voice. You're going to have to either teach or sing. You can't do both. It's just too much vocally. Ah, yeah. So I said, all right, I'm just going to focus on the singing. I was still kind of doing the real estate. And then the singing just really took off. And the real estate thing was kind of, you know, I could still refer. So if anyone's looking for a house yeah. or, you know, yeah. to buy or sell, I can right. refer them. I keep that active. But I'm, I've only been singing and um, doing music full time, just singing for like four, four or five Incredible. years now. Yeah. And last year, in 2013, how many singing dates did you have last year? I, was I counted, yeah, like 224 gigs. 224 gigs. gigs. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Incredible. You're Crazy. everywhere. You're, you've national anthems, yeah. singing, events, charity events, venues. Nursing homes. Nursing homes. Stuff for World War II vets, which I love to do. Incredible. Yeah, it's Incredible. Fun. Let me ask you this question. Singing a national anthem in the packed stadium versus singing in a restaurant venue or a charity event, 
Is there any different in terms of anxiety level of performing? Maybe in the beginning. Now I'm now I'm just excited to be out there, and I love it because nobody can talk. Like shh, it's yeah. just me. You know what? The national anthem, right? Yeah. They'll get them quiet. Everyone stands. <laughs> It's already a standing ovation. Yeah. No one can talk. It's just me. You know, I take my time. Um, you know, I, uh, the biggest crowd, I, I don't know if it was a few years ago when it was a Rays-Yankees game. It was postseason or close to it. was like in September. And yeah. I think it was like neck and neck first place. Um, last year I sang on 9-11. Boston was in town um, for the Rays. And then I sang for the Bucks. That was probably the biggest stadium. But I don't know if it was the biggest crowd. I don't, you know, it was preseason. But, um... I just, I love, you know, it's, yeah. it's, and I sing it straight. I don't embellish it. I don't do yeah. those vocal gymnastics. I kind of yeah. sing it the way that <laughs> right. it was written. Right. And people appreciate that wow. because it's the way it was. It's not really yeah. about me. It's so yeah. much as the song and why we're even singing it. How, over the last four or five years as you've been singing now f as a career, f I mean, full time as your profession, uh, you have such a unique, your style, you know, as a jazz a singer, the, the flavor, the genre that you're in. How have you had, adjusted or your, your voice or um, during that process? Um, you know what, honestly, I, I should really, I need to keep up on my instrument because I get, I get into these bad habits. I think because you're singing, I'm singing so much, you know, and I'm, I'm so, vo I'm like, I guess, reliable, relying on the vocal um, amplifications, microphones and things like that. Yeah. But I need to always be aware of my vocal tone, the breathing, like back to the basics. It's always the basics. Yeah. You know, and that's what anyone in any professional career is going to say. You have to have the basics. You know, because it's, you know, if you're an athlete, if you're a musician, um, you know, that's warming up, practicing it, it uh, always. Yeah. Because if you don't have that, I mean, no one's going to have a long career if they don't take care of their instrument, they don't take care of their body, whatever it is that they're doing. And, and I, need, I need to be more aware of that and, you know, slow down sometimes and say, okay, let's take care of this instrument and yeah. not just get, you know. So I've adjusted that, you know, that way. I'm more aware of what maybe happened naturally, you know, 10 years ago. I'm now like, okay, let me think about what's happening here, mm -hmm. you know, physically so yeah. that the sound is right. Yeah. Um, I'm getting stronger. As a jazz musician, I have to learn to become like a band leader. And I, I credit Nate Najar for helping me with that because he's like, Lisa, you know, you're going to want to come in and, you know, know, know your keys and know your tempos and, and all those things and kind of lead and they're going to follow you. And that's what band leaders do. Right. And uh, it's really helped me because I, there's a lot of times that I'm going to be singing with a band I've never sang with before. Wow. You know, and even though the music's there and we all are familiar with the tunes, they're looking to me to say, okay, well, how do you, how do you want us to play this? Yeah. So. How, how do you... You know, 200 and some odd events last year, all the events all, all around town. How do you manage your calendar? I mean, everybody sees the event, you know, Lisa, come check me out. I'm at Eddie V's tonight from 6 to 9 or from 7 to 10. But what goes on outside of those hours? There's a lot of hustling, marketing. Oh, no, I just booking. sit at home and, and eat bonbons all day. <laughs> People ask me, like, what do you do all day? Talk about that. Yeah, I don't have an an, an an agent or a manager. Now, some gigs, I, I do get called by an agency and say, yeah. so-and-so is requesting you, mm -hmm. you know, but it's kind of like because whoever their client is has heard of me, you know, and, or has heard of my style, or they know they have a client looking for something specific. Other than that, um, you know, in the beginning, I just had a, you know, I didn't even have a website. I just had a smile and a business card, you know, and I was going around and, um, you know, looking for work, and then it just, it kind of, the nice thing about Tampa is the community is, yeah. is big enough but small enough that word of mouth and, you know, my efforts, of course, you know, on, online and social media and stuff like that have helped. Yeah. But, you know, a typical day is basically, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to get my image out there. Yeah. You know, right now I'm trying to go national. Yeah. You know, how do you go national? You know, so, I, you know, I'm looking for someone to help me get over this hump of, of Tampa, this small area, yes. and, and getting my thing out there. And, you know, obviously I have video and, and audio, and that's why this new record's coming out. I need a new product. You know, you can hear me on Pandora. I mean, I've, I've heard myself playing in restaurants and stuff, but I heard myself playing in New York City in Columbus Circle. Oh, it's like incredible. First what time that, ever. What did that feel like? Oh, that it's feel like, everybody like? shut up. It's my music <laughs> playing <laughs> in New York City. Because we were, I was with my girlfriend. This, that was an amazing week in New York. Oh, it man. just happened to be like this trip from, like, heaven. I was bumped to first class. I wound up being on a television show, like the Michael, uh, you know, Kelly and Michael show yeah, live. It was yeah. just weird. And then, um, you know, I ran, in, I went to Birdland and was, you know, open mic, and a couple of musicians that I absolutely adore were there, and I couldn't believe I was meeting them. And then, I, you know, was walking with my girlfriend, 
in um, Whole Foods at Columbus Circle, and we were walking around like Lincoln Jazz Center. <laughs> yeah. And I said, "Oh, look! Yeah. Those look at it. we saw her last night. That's her name on the wall." And I said, "Can you imagine hearing my music here at you know the Jazz Center?" And then we walk into the lobby of the the shops, you know, the Time Warner shops, and I'm hearing my music. I'm hearing "Break a Leg," my song I wrote. The first time ever. I'd never heard it at Carabas. I'd never heard it at a you know hotel or an airport. People say they've heard it. Oh I was like, oh. I went to the lady at the front desk. I'm like, this is my song. She was like, no, no, we have live music. I go, no, this is not live because listen, you're gonna hear me singing in two minutes. <laughs> you know, and that was me. And I was so glad my friend Lisa was there because oh, other man, one, it takes no one would to capture yeah. that. It was crazy. It was yeah. so awesome. When you're performing and you're singing, or you or people are enjoying your music, what, what does that mean to you? What is it? What kind of fulfillment does that give? To it's you? fun. I mean, you know, I I just for me, I you know, when people request actually my original stuff or when I'm singing a song yeah. that everybody knows and it's all of a sudden it's a sing-along and but you know when I'm singing for the nursing homes or for like 60th wedding anniversary right. or you know a 90th birthday party you know things like that and I, I sing I sing for a 100 year old birthday party wow. last year it's probably the coolest thing I've ever done you know because you can see I mean it's like us when we hear a song from when we were yeah. in high school or yeah. you know college or little kids you know or uh, you see that you can see in their face there's a memory happening yeah. you know and whether it's, it's just classic your it's style great. your style and, and the songs it just means a classic. lot to me you yeah. know and to know that when I get a card from a, a client who's I sing at their wedding like you you made the whole event thank you for being there you yeah. you made this event and when I get a call like if it's an annual event and I get a call back every year we want you back we want you back I mean that says I'm doing something right you know and I love that yeah. Well, take just like you were walking in Columbus Circle, you said, oh "What if God. I heard my song?" Right? You put an intention. It was so crazy. You put an intention. So let's put an intention out. Yeah. Three to five years from now, as you're building your, your as you continue to build on your, your career, what? Let's put a vision out there. Yeah, Michael years. Bublé opening for me. <laughs> and you your know? style is comparative, yeah. right? Well, I think Absolutely. so because Without when question. you think about the jazz singers, female jazz singers, there's no one out there with that va va boom that Michael Bublé has in that has field. It, yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's no, no you know. Jessica Rabbit, per yeah. se, you know, like in yeah. a, I'm not that a cartoon character, yeah. but you know what I'm saying, something yeah. like that that's going to stir people up and, and get I, them I, when into... When I listen to your music, I, I, I'm on that same same wavelength, but from the, from your perspective, with your with your style as a female, love yeah. it, love it. It's fun. And going national, I mean, li living here in the Tampa Bay community, would there be any other cities that you would love to, to live in, or as you travel around the country, what is that? Uh, well, you know, I mean... I love New York. I'm a New Yorker. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the way that the world is now and the way that social media is now and YouTube and iTunes and everything else, you don't really have to live yeah. anywhere in particular because um, you can always travel and yeah. I can get travel bans. And, I, you know, I'm yeah. on the waiting list right now. Let's put it out there. The North by Northeast, you know, the South by Southwest Music Festival? Yeah. Yeah. I'm on the consideration list for the North by Northeast, which is up in Canada. It's yeah. Same, similar music festival. And they're going to let me know within a week's notice. And I'm going to have to hop on a plane and get up there right. and, and figure it out. But, um, you know, I, I would love, I'm going to vis be visiting New York soon. I'm going to LA soon. Of course, I want to make some stops like in Nashville and in New Orleans, awesome. Chicago, you know, where things are happening. Yeah. But you don't, you know, I love Tampa. I love the weather here. I, I have, I've built a home here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to get my startup to shine brighter yeah. and brighter here. Yeah. It's just only going to help me go national. Yeah. I don't really have to live anywhere else. Yeah. But I definitely want to be touring, and I, I, I want I want people to hear my music. Yeah, understood. You, know? so. you were very creative in your second album. Yeah. In raising money and hustling. Oh. Talk, talk a little bit about that as oh, far as man. having a dream, having a commitment, and, you know, it just says so much about your, your persistence and going out. Talk a little bit about that experience. You know, Kickstarter was the hardest thing I've ever done, like, in a long time. So I, I, I'm telling it to people straight, you know. I had, there's negative and positive to it. Yeah. Okay. The positive is, you know, I raised my funds. It was a successful campaign. And yeah. I have all of these people who love me, support me. When I first started, I was, I was nervous right. and I wasn't that confident. I was just like, well, but I was going to go for it. Like, it's an all or nothing. And I did it purposely on Kickstarter, not these other, like, GoFundMe or Indiegogo, because if I'm not going to raise all of it, then I don't want to keep any of it. You know, it's, right. it's one of those all things. Or nothing, yeah. Exactly. I did the shortest campaign I could do 30 days. Um, I wanted to build that urgency. Um, every penny that I've raised is accounted for. I knew exactly what it was going to cost. I've actually, you know, gone over that amount. Yeah. Um, but that just, that's just going to happen. Um, but the love and the support and seeing who's going on, who's supporting me and who's sharing it, it was 
unlike anything else. I mean, it just made, it gave me the confidence, yeah. you know, that I, that I, like, people believe in me. It's not just me. Yeah. And, and these people all are involved. And, um, you know, but then there's the backlash. There were some naysayers and other people in the same industry as me who I thought were friends and wanted to see me succeed that were not friends and were, you know, saying not nice things about me and, and, and making me and feel... And so how do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal um, with the naysayers, the negative? I, I got to tell you, it caught me off guard one day and I cried, <laughs> you know. And then I just said, you know what, but, it, but not to make a pun, but it, I kicked it up a notch. I said, oh, you don't think I can do this? Watch, I'm going to do it. And I didn't, after I was successful, I didn't go back and say, look, I told you I could do it. I just deleted, ignored, um, blocked. I haven't seen these people face to face. You know, I don't know what will happen when I'm a real person. Mm -hmm. So I might say, you know what, I'm disappointed in you because I would have been the first person in your camp cheering you on. Right. And yet you had to, behind right. my back or whatever, in a public forum, say, you know, negative things about what I'm trying to accomplish here. We're all after the same thing. Yeah. So you, know? you had your moment of disappointment. I did. I cried for a day. <laughs> and then you got yourself and I was like, off. Mm, let's go. Let's do yeah. this. Yeah. And it's okay to feel that pain and then to, to, you know, to, to, to step back You know, I don't, you know, I'm sensitive. Yeah. I care. And, you know, I don't have a thick skin. And, and I, you know, even though I should, I, you know, I'm just, my, my, my dad and my brothers always say, Lisa, that's what makes you so beautiful. Right. Like, don't change. Don't right. change who you are. Right. You know, learn from it you know try to be a little bit smarter but yeah. you know you don't want to shut yourself off and not care yeah. and it you know it bothered me to a degree where I you know I talked to some friends about it but at the end of the day you know I look back again at the positive over 217 people some people I don't even know some people I barely know some people I know very very well they all stepped up to the plate and said we believe Incredible, in you and we're gonna help right. you and that's what I yeah. that's what I focus on that's what I linger on yeah. that sort of thing so. if you reflect back to where you are from today, yeah. going back when you made the move to go into this on a full-time basis of your career, yeah. what what came to fruition that you thought would, or what was something that you didn't really expect? I mean, what did you, what lessons did you learn along this journey so far? Um, you know, I, everyone always said it's, you know, to be a musician, it's hard, you know, to make a living, and it is. It's not, it's not for the, you know, the flippant, yeah. or you don't want to rest on your laurels. What I, what I'm noticing. You got to make sure you want it. You have to want it. Like, everyone can say they, a girlfriend of mine said, you know, people say they want to do things, but what are they doing in their day-to-day -to, -day to make those things happen? True. You know, you're, you're doing it. You're making, yeah. you're, you're taking the steps, you know, the, dif the difficult ones. You know, I always say, like, you know, I love my job. It's the best job in the world. I've never met a musician who regretted what they did for a living. Never. You know? But the, sometimes it's difficult, and I think, well, Lisa, if you can't handle this part, then you can't be in any of it. You know, gigs are going to cancel. Restaurants are going to, you know, right. cancel you last minute without telling you. Um, you know, you're going to, so you get smarter. Now I have contracts in place. I'm very good about, um, you know, like they always say, you know, under promise, over deliver, that sort of thing. Yeah. I know what I'm good at, and I know where, if it's a gig that they're looking for something, I don't think, I'd say, you know, I don't think I'm the right person you want to hire for this, but right. let me help you. And I love helping other musicians, you know, that oh, I'm, awesome, I'm, I'm busy, yeah. you know, and there's a lot of things that I can't do. And rather than say, no, I'm sorry, you know, I, good luck finding someone, I'm, why not help a friend out? Why not yeah. say, this is another amazing musician in the area, they'd be wonderful. Yeah. And awesome. so that's also good, that's also fun, cause, because I have a lot of jazz gigs, I get to hire other musicians, it's not just me you know, with an iPod or me with a and guitar. you build the brand, people trust you, respect you, we see somebody's good and you still yeah. put them into your network. And That's they awesome. are, yeah, and so I, I play with the best musicians in town. What can you say to somebody that maybe has a desire, a passion, that you know, wants to be a singer or maybe wants to write a book or start a new career, whatever, I mean, you stepped out, regardless, you said it's, you know, I was single, whatever, but the reality is you did it. You yeah. moved towards that <laughs> goal, right? So what can you say to somebody that has a dream or a passion of doing something, but or maybe holding back. What, what kind of insight can you give them to maybe inspire them to take that step? You know, it's hard to say. I mean, I just, I hate the whole YOLO, you only live once, that sort of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. But I, I just think that, you know, if, if, it's, if it's something you wake up and think about, I think I had this in a movie somewhere, and it's so true. Like, if you wake up and all you can think about is singing, then you're supposed to be a singer. Wow. If you wake up and all you can think about is writing, then you're supposed to be a writer. Wow. Now, are you going to have natural talent? Are you going to need to take lessons? I mean, I, you know, I went to school for music. Yeah. So it's not like, I mean, I had that gift and I got into the school, you have to audition, but, you know, it's not, you know, it's something you have to work on. Put yourself in that situation. For instance, two years ago, two and a half years ago, I wasn't playing a guitar for my gig. 
I always wanted to play guitar, but like I never really wanted to practice. I didn't want to cut my nails, that sort of thing. And then I heard again the grapevine. Oh, she's not a musician. She just sings. Well, no, I can play the piano, I play the sax, I play the violin, I play the flute. I have a degree in music. I can play all the instruments. Okay, but nothing I really play performance-wise. Right. And I'm not saying I'm great on the guitar, but I said okay. So I took two months of guitar lessons, and I booked myself a gig where I had to play guitar, <laughs> like it's in two months, you know, like another uh. month from that. And I just practiced, like I only had to do a few songs. So I practiced those six songs like over and over again, just kept practicing, practicing, practicing. And now, I mean, I have four gigs in the next 48 hours. You know, tonight I'm at Picant in Hyde Park. Tomorrow I'm at the Serrata and then at the Vinoy and then Sunday I'm at Chicho's in, in what, Soho. What, what They're you, all guitar gigs. What do you pull from when you're working so hard and you're getting tired and you're doing a lot of these gigs? What, what do you pull from to keep yourself going and moving forward? I don't want to be awful. <laughs> I want to be good. I want to keep working. I want to get better. I want to get bigger. I want, you know, I want people to hear me and say, she's really good. You know, it's not like you can be in your house and, and no one's going to hear you. Yeah. You know, the, the pressure is putting yourself in that position and, and making sure that you don't set yourself up to fail. Yeah. And that's how it was with my students. Like, we would rehearse ad nauseum. Oh, that was perfect. Do it again. That was perfect. Do it again. I want them to go out on that stage, feel confident, like they can do it, you know, with their eyes closed, hands behind their backs, and know that they're going to do well because they know it so well. You know, we were just talking with Tony earlier, and, you know, the repetition. He said he had three months to prepare for his... Uh, for the NBC, for The Voice, and he had the song, he had three months, and then every day, practicing it over and over and over. From a teacher's perspective, how do you get somebody to, to fight through the doldrums of repetition? How do you, how do you go through that? I know when I used to play football, our, my coach used to say, pretend there's 80,000 people in the, in, the, in, the, in the stands watching you right now. Right. Whatever you gotta do to motivate yourself, and, you know, because you're going through the motions, you're like, yeah. how do you fight through that? Um, okay, so I always say like perfect, perfect practice makes perfect, yeah. you know, I mean, and I, and I tell like this is my anecdotes for my students, you know, you have to be able to run 27 miles before you go and do a 27 mile yeah. marathon or however yeah. miles it is. You can't just do a mile, one, one mile every day for 28 days. So, it, you know, when as a teacher, I know my students were getting kind of bored with it, so I would just make it fun. I would say, all right, listen, what we're going to do is we're going to have the half the group is going to perform, the other half is going to critique them. Or the boys are going to do the ah. girls' part, or the girls are going to do the boys' part. Or I, I would come in with a costume on, pretend I'm a sub. Hi, I'm your substitute, Mrs. Crabtree. <laughs> like, I'd have a wig and glasses, and the kids would be like, you're such a dork, Miss Hertzner. But, you know, and I would, I, would, I would put my name, I'm Mrs. Crabtree, and I would say, your, your teacher can't be here today, so I'm here as your sub. And she said, and just make it fun, you know. But yeah. so for me, I, you know, I, I might set up a camera, or, you know, um, when I'm working on something, you know, I'm, a, a lot of times I'm in the car listening to it and, mm -hmm. you know, internalizing it, you know, but it, uh, you for have me, to play the site. You have to play the mind games right. to keep yourself moving. I just don't want to be bad. I want to be good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I want to be prepared. I want to feel confident. Awesome. So. So <laughs> we're so appreciative. You know, you're, you are one of the reasons why uh, we're living the good life here in Tampa Bay. Thanks. We're so fortunate to have you in our community, in, our, in, our, in the area, because your message, your music, your inspiration your energy uh, being positive and out there in the community we're just so fortunate so we're so glad you're here on our Thank show you. today number one and number two is that where can people go to learn more about you your music your cds the the event coming up on may okay, 27th yeah well um you know i have a facebook Lisa Castellino. I have a Twitter, Lisa Castellino. I have a website, lisacastellino.com. However, it's Flash. So I finally, and again, I'm doing all of this. Like, I'm my own website designer. I'm, you know, it's a one-woman show. I did a, a website called lisacastellinomobile.com. Okay. So you can see it on your iPhone now, your iPad, your, uh, all that, because you couldn't before. Um, so, you know, if you Google Lisa Castellino, I'm all, it's, I'm all over the internet right now. So, like, but um, I have my calendars up there on Bands in Town. Um, you know, I'm that accessible that if you were to message me, hey, where are you going to be? I'm pretty good at getting back at people. Um, I'm going to be um, on a couple of other, you know, TV shows and, and spotlights before my record comes out. It actually releases May 20th, but the concert is May 22nd at the Palladium in St. Pete at 7.30. If you go to mypalladium.org, you can search Lisa Casolino and um, you can see, you know, where you can get tickets. It's going to be such a great concert. I've got the best musicians at it. It will sell out because right now I'm at the side door. So it's about 120 tickets. And when I did my last release, I had over 220 people show up. So I'm hoping for a great turnout. 
Um, Nate Nate Jar is on guitar, Kenny Drew is on the piano, Alejandro Lane is on the bass. Um, Mark Fine, uh, no, Mark Fine won't be there, but he's on the record for the drums. We have Dave Rudolph playing the drums, and I've got this phenomenal saxophone player, uh, Jeff Rupert, coming over from Orlando, and maybe maybe John Lamb will show up. John Lamb is on my record. He's a bass player. He's 80 years old. He played with Duke Ellington in Duke Ellington's band. I know it's phenomenal. Oh, wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. So well, maybe he'll be a little guest. Good luck to you on the new Thank CD, you. new album. We look forward to following your continued success, Tampa Bay, and then following you all the way through Nashville. Let's do it. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. So be sure to check out Lisa's new album and keep up to date with her at LisaCasolino.com. That's LisaCasolino.com.